everyone to the CTS Net webinar on the guest editor series, Right Auxiliary Thoracic Dominant for Repair of a Wide Variety of Congenital Heart Defects in Infants and Children. Should this be the new standard? Curated by guest editor Sunday Saeed. Thank you for joining us. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available next Tuesday on ctsnet.org and ctsnet's YouTube channel. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce CTSNet guest editor and moderator of this webinar, Sunday Saeed. Professor Saeed is the Chief of Pediatric and Adult Congenital Cardiac Surgery at the Maria Ferreri Children's Hospital at the Westchester Medical Center in New York Medical College in Valhalla, New York, United States. He also retains membership across a multitude of global surgical associations and societies. Most recently, Professor Saeed officially joined the CTSNet editorial team as community's senior congenital editor, starting from July 2023. Welcome, Summer. The floor is yours. Um, hello. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks, John. Um, uh, welcome to this uh, webinar and CTSNet uh, guest editor series. Uh, i like first to thank all the editorial staff at CTSNet, um, Cameron Lynn, Mary Hammond, and uh, John Janiszewski, uh, for helping us putting this interesting congenital webinar together. Today, we are discussing an important topic, which is the right axillary thoracotomy approach for repair of a wide variety of congenital heart defects in infants and children. And a key question is, should this approach be considered the new gold standard? Uh, this is a very important topic because this approach is a game changer when it comes to repairing congenital heart defects in children due to the several advantages that we have seen and the positive experience the patients received from undergoing this approach. Uh, it has changed the care of these children. And the goal of this seminar is to discuss the merits of this approach and to, to clarify several of the myths that patients sometimes hear about this approach from physicians, surgeons, and other providers who are not familiar with it. I'm very honored today uh, to be joined uh, by three fantastic pediatric cardiac surgeons uh, who are world experts in this approach, which each one has hundreds of, of cases under uh, his belt. Um, and each one was kind enough to provide us with a different procedure that is done through the right axillary thoracotomy, which I hope everyone had the time to watch these excellent contributions from our guests today prior to this webinar. I would like to introduce our esteemed guests today uh, from the German Heart Center in Munich, uh, Dr. Paul Heinisch, who in co collaboration with Dr. Uh, Julie uh, Clegio provided us with an excellent video for repair of a secondum septal defect in a 12 month old child. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Clegio uh, will not be joining us today due to other commitments. Uh, welcome, Paul. From the University Hospital from Aachen, uh, Germany, Dr. Uh, Ali Doj Katami, who provided us with an excellent video uh, showing his tips and pitfalls uh, for using a right axillary thoracotomy for repairing a, a membranous ventricular septal defect. Uh, welcome, Dr. Katami. And we have uh, Dr. Alexander Papliak uh, from the Diagnostic and Treatment Center for Children and Adults of the uh, Dobrobat Medical uh, Network, Kiev, uh, Ukraine who demonstrated his technique uh, for repair of a very challenging case of anomalous origin of the lifted coronary artery from the pulmonary artery and a mitral valve repair uh, in a one year and nine month old uh, girl. The last video in this series was presented by our team uh, from Rochester Medical Center and Maria Ferrari Children showing an intraatrial buffer repair of a sinus venosus and a partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection uh, in a four year old boy. Today, we'll start with a discussion with our guests about the video presentation, and this will be followed by an open discussion about the right axillary approach. And for everyone who's joining us today, uh, please feel free to ask any question to our speakers today at any time uh, using the Q&A function uh, of the Zoom. And at the end of the session, we will try our best to answer all the questions that we receive. Now, let's time, it's time to dive in the uh, discussion. And uh, we will follow with the orders of the video that were presented as part of this series. And we'll start with Dr. Uh, Heinisch and his video about the uh, secundum atrioseptal defect repair. Um, please, uh, uh, Paul, feel free to, to start. Hello, thank you very much for the opportunity um, to participate in this webinar. 
Um, in our center, we performed a case of the AC closure in a patient who was formerly premature. Uh, initial birth weight was 2.7 kilos. She presented with a um, atrial secundum defect um, at the time of uh, hospitalization and at the age of 12 months. Um, she was at 7.1 kilos and we decided to do a um, AC closure to a uh, right-sided mid-axillary thoracotomy. Um, we performed these procedures um, in a left-sided um, position um, to a mid-axillary onto horizontal incision. In general, we use um, in all cases a central cannulation in these patients. We try to avoid any femoral um, access to the vein or to the artery in those cases for the moment. And those patients are treated um, through the um, ventricular fibrillation after uh, central cannulation. We induce a ventricular fibrillation probe to the right ventricle and under fibrillation, we have most often close the AC with a Gore-Tex patch in a continuous fashion. Um, this is mostly done in, in a very short time um, with standard equipment and procedures. We don't need any new or specialized equipment to do this procedure. And normally we treat this patient with above 10 kilos, but we started to reduce the uh, indication for the weight as well in those patients, especially with the ACs. Uh, we have pretty good experience with this uh, for this by now. And uh, in those cases, um, we have a very short intubation period. Some patients we try to extubate in the operating room, which is not always possible um, due to the programming. Um, those patients uh, recover quite fast, um, mostly one day on the ICU and a short period of time on the general ward as well. Um, this kind of operation is performed mostly for ASD, sinusvenosus. However, we also started to extend the spectrum towards partial AVSD as well. Uh, we haven't done any VSDs yet, but uh, after seeing uh, Dr. Katam's video as well, we try to think about it as well, which is very impressive. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, you you brought uh, um, a few uh, good points, actually. S so um, you use the horizontal incision, and um, uh, I want to talk to uh, our speakers as well about this because um, it was uh, nice that we had actually two videos showing a vertical incision and two videos showing a horizontal incision, and that's one of the common questions we hear from the audience. So um, it, w what do you feel about uh, this incision? Um, at, my other, at my other center where, uh, where I was educated in the beginning in Switzerland and in, in Bern, um, I was trained at the vertical incision as well, so the same technique uh, Professor Dr. Katami uses as well, and I was used to the um, horizontal as the vertical incision as well, which I think has very um, very good benefits regarding uh, cosmetics as well, because if you uh, lower the arm, you don't see any scarring as well. Um, apparently, uh, at the current center, they had some issues also with um, healing and so on, and they switched to a um, horizontal incision instead of the vertical. I think um, it depends on your experience as well. So I had, I've heard arguments for both both ways as well. Um, I don't, as, at the the moment, uh, having seen both at an equal number of cases, I have not seen any differences from a clinical point of view, to be honest. But this is from experience, this is my own experience, so maybe. Uh, I think if you ask a couple, of, a couple of people, they have probably different experience as well. Thank you. And uh, uh, Ali, uh, you um, were uh, talking to me about that you actually did both approaches and you switched. So can you uh, enlighten us a little bit about this? Sure. Uh, I, I think actually Paul and I probably had our origins of being uh, introduced to this approach at the same uh, from the same person, I would say. We, we kind of all are indebted uh, to uh, René Pretre in, in Zurich, where we started this approach in 2005. And at the time, uh, I was there, uh, Alex Kadner, who was now in Bern, uh, and I think Paul worked with uh, as well as Hitendu, and we kind of all saw the variations of uh, starting from something simple with ASDs and taking it uh, you know, step by step to do more complex things like partial AV canals and VSDs. Uh, we, we actually also started with the horizontal incision. It seemed to us like, um, especially in, in young girls, uh, it would be an incision hidden in the bra line uh, in, or in a bikini line, which wouldn't be seen. Um, and also because of the, of the parallel uh, you know, opening into the ribs, 
it would be there would be less tension in the with the approach uh, with a with a horizontal incision. Um, I think about a year into the experience, we actually switched to the vertical because we ended up having a couple of problems. Um, when we needed a bit more access, you know, the the horizontal incision is parallel to the lines of loser of the skin, and so it's kind of a, a with regards to skin tension, it's the path of least resistance. And we had one or two accidental tears uh, in the skin uh, while we were, maybe, maybe we cranked open the spreader a bit too much. And one or two of these tears went a bit way too anterior towards the, the nipple. And when we had that, I think we kind of uh, thought, well, let's let's try the, the vertical and, uh, and basically switched. So we actually had one or two bad experiences, cosmetic, which were suboptimal, uh, they made us change. Um, it so turns out that I don't think, you know, although it's perpendicular to the opening that you're doing in the ribs, right, the skin incision, uh, if you, and I, I tried to point it out in the video, if you release tension from the inside uh, with the periosteum, et cetera, you can still uh, have really good access and be able to, uh, you know, open up the chest spreader without breaking the ribs or anything, so. Thank yeah, you. I do agree. I do agree with the Professor Kat uh, Katami on, on this issue as well because I think the logical gives you uh, if you need to exclude ex extension of the incision and need more space, it's much more convenient to do this with the vertical incision and the horizontal one because the older the patient gets, if you do a horizontal inc incision, you tend to work, get towards the breast, especially in young uh, females. This is not very optimal. So um, you can also you do this with standard equipment as well. You can use two little um, um, forex um, holders as well. It's not a problem. So uh, if you've seen uh, in some videos as well, so that I think it's cosmetically it's and, and technically it's it's a good incision as well. It's just uh, uh, getting used to it. I think in some cases. Yeah, I think if, if you're if you're missing just one or one and a half centimeters to have better exposure to do what you need to do, and you need to prolong a vertical incision, ultimately it's still going to be hidden by the resting arm, and yeah. really it's not not visible to the patient. So I think yeah. for those reasons, it's a it has some advantages. I agree. And uh, Alexander, what's what's your experience? I mean, you you showed no limits to the right axillary thoracotomy with with your video, basically in a very challenging case. And it was also horizontal incision. Are you in favor of one versus the other? Um, I I uh, have the experience only with the horizontal incision. I, but I have one uh, tip because uh, skin is. Uh, is uh, very movable so if you need to extend uh, the horizontal incision uh, you can uh, you can uh, extend it uh, to the back or uh, over the latissimus and uh, but you will still have the same uh, access from the uh, from the skin point so uh, you will not go uh, to the front I also uh, believe that with the experience that uh, all minimally invasive surgeons um, have with the small incision, you you just uh, need uh, four centimeters um, length uh, for adult, uh, uh, for more uh, older, and uh, maybe a little bit less for uh, small uh, kids. So I have seen uh, the videos of my uh, uh, colleagues, and uh, uh, all the incisions uh, were very nice from the cosmetical point of view. Uh, some regardless, um, some horizontal or uh, vertical. Um, thank you for uh, these valuable points and. Uh... Uh, on our side, uh, uh, we really started with the vertical incision, and in and in one patient I had to do was was a little bit older. I had to do a double thoracotomy through the the vertical incision, which I I found it very convenient. You still maintain the same uh, elegant closure at the end, and uh, it gives you maybe a little bit more safety margin um, if you need to. Uh, and 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 Paul, you brought a, another really good point is. Using this approach does not require really any special equipment uh, compared to adult minimally invasive uh, uh, cases that we see, uh, which is something important for the audience to understand. We're using the same instrument. We did not change anything. Uh, what do you think? 
I think it's true. I mean, most of the stuff we have inst from instruments from genital surgery we can use for the la lateral approach. And uh, yes, you can um, also you, as in older patients, you can use minimal invasive um, instruments from adults as well. We have done that when the patient gets older, but in our classical um, congenital pediatric congenital patients, we can just use the basic stuff we have in the operating room. And uh, what we started to do, especially on the, uh, my old center in Switzerland in Bern, we started for uh, more complex cases for uh, the complete AV canals um, and partial AVSDs. We started using femoral cannulation with a percutaneous uh, femoral vein, so we gain more space in the inferior cable vein. This was quite advantageous because we can could gain more surgical space, especially for the uh, AV valve, which was very helpful. And um, we also did some cannulations in patients of, at five kilos for a percutaneous approach. And we just used the biomedical um, ECMO cannula, which is available for percutaneous venous cannulation. And this can be helpful in cases in which you need more space, more surgical space, especially to observe the um, and evaluate the AV valve. Thank you. Um, and uh, you've uh, you've used the fibrillatory arrest, uh, which is something um, sometimes makes surgeons nervous uh, about opening the heart, you know, mm -hmm. without uh, cross clamp. Um, but you've seen doing this uh, pretty much a routine in your ASD. We do it in the ASD and the venous venosa mm. routinely. But for VSDs and everything else, uh, we have to evaluate the valve as well. Uh, for example, PAVSD, we use cardioplegia. Hmm. Um, I think in many centers in the States, the fibrillatory box even is not known anymore in the operating room. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and Ali, have, have you used the fibrillatory arrest? I, I see all your videos with the cross clamber cardioplegia. No, also, also for ASDs, we use uh, fibrillatory, uh, fibrillatory uh, arrest. Um, actually, initially, we were doing all of the cases, uh, including VSDs, including partial uh, canals with induced fibrillation. And I must say, uh, you know, there's, there is a learning curve to this. I was very nervous in my first 10 to 20 cases uh, of not having, uh, you know, the, not having a cross clamp on. Um, I, we just didn't feel comfortable enough with the approach to realize that actually it's it's not that much of a big deal that uh, you do have enough room for the cross clamp and the plegia uh, with a couple of extra trips uh, tips that I think all of us have shown uh, with taking away the right atrial appendage with uh, uh, as you mentioned uh, you know in some instances you need to open up two intercostal spaces uh, sometimes you know if you open up the third intercostal space cannulation of the aorta and supravena cava is very easy because it's sitting right there Whereas to, from the third, closing a VSD is much more challenging. On the other hand, if you open up from the fourth, your, your intracardiac repair is probably easier, but cannulation could be more challenging in a larger patient. So as you mentioned, sometimes open up two spaces if you need uh, and do, do part of your cannulation in one, uh, do your repair through the other. And if you use a vertical incision, it doesn't change the length of your incision. So that's the, but I, I think, to, to your question, with comfort, with the approach and little tips and tricks, uh, we realized that actually we did have room for the cross clamp. We did have room for the uh, for the cardioplegia needle. Um, so now I only do ventric ventriculatory uh, fibrillation for simple ASDs, which are going to be short. I think myocardial protection is better with uh, with. Plegia, if you're going to do anything beyond 40 minutes of uh, induced fibrillation, you're probably not going to get the best you know, myocardial protection as you would with cardioplegia. I, I, I agree. This is a great point. Um, and, and now we'll move to um, uh, um, your your video and the tips and pitfalls about the VSD uh, closure. So please feel free to, uh, to discuss uh, your case. Right. Um, the, the video is of, a, of an infant uh, with a typical perimeminous VST. Um, we've done these cases from uh, anywhere between four and a half kilos to uh, teenager sized patients. Um, I think this, this patient was uh, five to six months old, uh, more or less in the uh, five, six kilo range. So uh, 
pretty straightforward. Uh, as both of you have mentioned, no special instruments, uh, you know, the standard instruments, uh, entry through the fourth, fourth intercostal space, central cannulation, uh, cardioplegia. Uh, one point uh, I may want to make with regards to the different cardioplegia strategies. Um, just about every place that I've worked in, um, except our center now, uh, has used uh, Del Nido, which basically gives you, you know, one hour of peace. Um, and um, if you're going to use something else, which is what we have, we have a, a choice between um, either Brett Schneider, which is Custodio. Um, it's a crystalloid based, um, and that's because our program is focusing on uh, being as transfusion or, or blood free as possible, um, or uh, the Calafiore, which is also you know, crystalloid based. Um, either way, um, I think you need to kind of uh, do your choice based on, you know, what, what you have, obviously. Uh, the disadvantage of using something like Calafiore or a short uh, acting uh, agent is that every 20 minutes you're going to have to give plege again. Whereas to if you have a long acting agent uh, like uh, Del Nido or Brett Schneider, is really you give one shot, you can take out the cardioplegia needle because that, that needle in a, in a 4.5 kilo uh, infant is going to take up some precious space. You can take it out once you've given the plegia, and then you have one hour to work. And you can always de-air afterwards or put the needle back. So um, afterwards, with regards to uh, the VSD closure, I think the, the fundamental point and the teaching point I tried to make in the video is that you need to take the tricuspid valve down. Um, for me, it was an easy thing to do because this is how I used to close VSDs, or I still do, from the front. And I think if you if you if you if the routine is to take down the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve when you close any VSD, including for a tetralogy repair or a double outlet repair, an inlet VSD or a perimenous VSD. If that's your routine through a sternotomy, then it it's really not different through the thoracotomy. Um, so. To those who ask the question, how often do you need to do it? I would say always. You just have much better exposure of the VSD. Um, and I can't imagine it would be possible to, to do it without taking the tricuspid valve down. Um, obviously, the caveat is that at the end, um, well, you have, you have to be careful how you take it down. Uh, leave one or two millimeters of a rim of tricuspid tissue as you're cutting it down with a sharp uh, knife so that it's easy to reconstruct with the 7-0 continuous proline so that you don't have TI, which would be an iatrogenic problem. Um, I think that's fundamental because otherwise, I don't think cardiology or the patients would be very happy, uh, you know, if, if you had TI as one of your, uh, you know, uh, as one of your complications. So um, that, that's one of the most important things. Otherwise, uh, whether you close your VSD with uh, interrupted sutures or with a continuous as I do, um, it really doesn't make a difference as long as you close it. Um, I have specified, I think, in the video, the order in which you do things. Um, and that's not just to be, you know, to show you my uh, dogma, but I think um, you kind of use the anchor VSD patch to give you further exposure. And by doing it in the way that I've shown in the video, which is uh, anchor your patch at um, 12 o'clock way away from you and do your inferior border coming towards you, it actually pulls the VSD and gives you better exposure. And once you have that anchor through the tricuspid valve annulus, then you can do the superior border and each stitch that you take exposes the next stitch. Um, I found that it makes uh, seeing the upper border much easier and it avoids residuals. Um, so that, that, that's why this order of doing things I think is important just for the exposure. Uh, and avoiding residual defects. Uh, otherwise, the remainder is fairly straightforward. Uh, I think all of us have seen, you know, the decannulation where we put the chest tubes uh, or chest tube. Um, our experience has also been that with this approach, even if we're doing more complex uh, cases like partial AV canals, um, the ICU time is short. We do in theater extubation, which we managed to do in ninety six percent of our cases in total, which is which is fairly good. Uh, we use a serratus block currently in our current institution. So that's, I think, a, uh, an important thing with regards to pain management. And one of the myths of 
thoracotomies being more painful than a sternotomy, I think needs to disappear. I don't, I don't think it's true, um, quite honestly. Uh, and also we, we've had different protocols. Um, in Zurich, we put intercostal catheters ourselves with a continuous row of um, protocol for 48 hours. Uh, in Houston, we had uh, uh, epidurals placed by anesthesia one hour prior to heparinization. Uh, they felt very comfortable with that, and that provided excellent pain control. And here at our hospital, we do uh, serratus blocks at the end of the case. And that really gives the, the kids beautiful pain control for at least 24 hours, uh, at which time we can uh, switch them over to, to oral. And I think in one of the our studies that we did with the follow-up, we actually showed that our uh, use of morphine-based or opioid-based analgesics was reduced significantly, which I which I think is a plus for the kids. Um, yeah, that's that. The, these are uh, really excellent points, and uh, uh, you, you've you've discussed the several things. And back to the to the VSD, I, I like really the way the you highlighted it in your video with the. Uh, 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 animation there and uh, picking up a translucent area in the in the septal leaflet and uh, staying away from the base of the leaflet just a few millimeters so you can attach it and and the points about bringing the inferior margin and then pulling as as you uh, uh, take every bite that would bring the entire uh, defect yeah. which is uh, uh, really uh, uh, excellent um uh, uh, alexander you had uh the bablek maneuver uh in uh, one of your videos and uh, i think it was published also in the uh, journal of innovation last year uh would you uh, uh, please talk about this uh, for vsd exposure um Yes, uh, so uh, uh, the surgeon can uh, uh, put uh, the uh, stitch at the intraventricular uh, septum uh, close uh, close uh, to moderator, and after pulling this uh, stitch, the septum uh, comes uh, to the view because uh, because a surgeon access the uh, the VSD from the side, so the septum is uh, some parallel to the surgeon uh, view. But after after making this uh, maneuver, uh, we can change the position of the intraventricular uh, septum, which uh, uh, helps uh, not uh, not uh, which uh, helps to expose uh, the VSD and. Uh, like the surgeon usually usually does uh, during uh, do, uh, through the median uh, sternotomy. So, so uh, I uh, believe that we can uh, apply some most of the maneuvers that we use in the median uh, sternotomy to the right axillary uh, sorocotomy because we can move the cardioplegic uh, heart inside the chest and we can expose one and second uh, uh, portion uh, time by time. Uh, great. And uh, uh, one of the things I, I, I find also helpful is sometimes um, looping the cords of the tricuspid valve with a vessel loop or a, or a silk tie and pulling this can bring some of the difficult uh, VSDs in view as well, uh, prior even to uh, putting any sutures. Um, and and uh, uh, Ali, uh, you mentioned great points about the incision itself, uh, which is uh, great as a start uh, uh, the, to improve the exposure and also uh, clarify one of the problems that we hear, but uh, I, I don't think we see it uh, like the old days, which is risk of scoliosis uh, with the, uh, children having thoracotomy. It's one of the myths that we hear from uh, 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 surgeons and physicians. So would you please comment on that? Sure. Um, I, I think I, I kind of picked this up based on uh, some tips I got from uh, from uh, thoracic surgeons, because I think this is their classical technique of how to open and how to close. And it actually became relevant, uh, you know, nowadays they, there's the piccolo for all of the PAD, PDAs. So we don't get to do PDAs in premature babies anymore, but uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was, uh, you know, on a weekly basis. I think in those premature babies, 
it's very important to open and close the chest properly so uh, that they don't get rib fusion, which does lead to scoliosis. And I think that's been shown in the in the neonatal literature, uh, having thoracotomies. Basically, to extend that is that when, um, well, for, first of all, when we position, uh, as is shown in the video, we, um, even after taping the arm so that it doesn't move and, you know, we, we stabilize the patient, uh, which ho however method you want to position, uh, once they're on the table, we still check that the scapula is completely, you know, we do the little uh, tip on the shoulder, uh, that it's still mobile because if you have uh, if you have frozen the chest and the shoulder just by taping and positioning the patient, uh, chances are that the, the entire chest is going to be stiff. And uh, while while you're opening, if you're not careful, it is very easy to have rib fracture. And then at that point, the myth of a thoracotomy becoming more painful becomes a reality because then they are really in pain if you break their ribs. So. Uh, make, make sure once you position the patient and you're taped and everything that that scapula is still completely mobile with regards to the chest wall. Uh, and that will improve the, the general, you know, relaxability of the incision. Um, in the video, it is shown how we peel off the periosteum from the, the intercostal space that we want to open. We peel that off uh, and keep it intact in a curve that you can see, so that at the end, when you reapproximate the ribs, you only take the inferior rib and the top of that periosteum. You don't go around two ribs because if you pull together, the ribs are going to come together, and rib fusion, which you know will be obvious in a couple of years, can lead to scoliosis if you do these in, in infants. So I think meticulous opening and closing of chest closure. Um, is just as an important part of the case as the intracardiac uh, repair uh, quality. Uh, uh, absolutely. And then uh, one of the tips also that helps exposure, and I think uh, everybody shown in their videos, is the way that the surgeon should place the pericardial stay sutures, because that really helps bringing the entire uh, uh, heart in view. Yeah. I, I would add to uh, Alexander's comment, uh, um, it's one of the things I insist upon when I'm teaching these cases. Uh, the, the three um, the three stay sutures that I put into the annulus of the tricuspid valve, the one at, uh, let's say, 9 o'clock, the aortic valve, and 12 o'clock at, at the top of the tricuspid are obvious. Um, but one of the most important ones, which we you would think is not important, is the one at 3 o'clock at the bottom of the tricuspid valve, close to the coronary sinus, you think, well, you know, I'm doing a VSD uh, on the other side. Why is that important? That stitch and pulling it up brings the entire frame of the tricuspid valve towards yourself and away from the feet also tilts it and really improves uh, exposure of anything you're doing in that AV valve area. And it's a really critical stitch, I think, which helps quite a bit for exposure. And, uh, and I think that uh, also important when you consider uh, doing uh, uh, the axillary thoracotomy for a little bit more different types of VSD than the membranous, uh, such as the supracrystal. And uh, I, I think um, uh, I would like to, to hear your input about uh, you've, at the end of your video, you mentioned that all membranous VSDs, uh, inlet muscular and mid muscular, can be uh, approached to a right and selective. Uh, super crystal type how do you determine uh, which one you should address with this approach right um the the, the selective uh, ones that i mentioned in my experience have unfortunately been not planned um in other words um and i think this is a, a part of part of the um how do you say the uh, indications to do this to a right axillary have in my mind changed and expanded a bit um i was prior only offering this to all VSTs except for super crystals. And um, one of the points that I always ask the pediatric cardiologist to come to the operating room uh, and we make the final decision uh, based on the intraoperative TEE is how far away is the VST from the, from the pulmonary valve. And, you know, if you don't have that uh, bit of conus and distance from the pulmonary valve and you're dealing with a true super crystal VST, in the past, I have not offered this approach. Um, it's happened to me a couple of times that we miss 
you know, we underestimated or overestimated the distance to the pulmonary valve. And I happen to be in the presence of a, a supercrystal VST, you, you end up closing it. Um, it may even require a right ventricular, uh, a, a right infundibular in incision, which in the beginning I was not at all comfortable doing, but you, when you have to do it, that's what you do. And that gives you exposure. So uh, I've seen that it is actually possible. A recent article from the group in Beijing published uh, some huge number of uh, hundreds of patients with super crystals. And I was quite impressed uh, also with, uh, with pictures and uh, that it's, it's their routine. So I think based on that, the couple of accidents that happened to me, plus the fact that there is a group that's been doing hundreds of them through the same approach, um, I think we'll get more comfortable to offer that to, to supercrystal VSTs, but it is more challenging and it may require an additional incision. Mm. Um, and um, uh, you brought the point about pain management, and I'd like to hear uh, everyone insight about this. Um, uh, we've, we, we agree that significant uh, a drop in the narcotic use uh, was a little bit surprise actually to me first. Uh, when we started utilizing the approach, we, we did the pain management uh, that we used to with narcotic post-op because we didn't know what to do if we don't give narcotics. And then uh, lately, we have not been giving any narcotics postoperative at all to these patients because of the intraoperative, um, we, we do spinal block uh, with, with uh, codal morphine. And we do also uh, sometimes, uh, 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 we moved it from a catheter because of uh, uh, the time that it takes to uh, for anesthesia to, to place it prior to start to just, uh, uh, a, a epidural or a spinal. Uh, so, uh, uh, Paul, uh, how is your pain management uh, in in your institution? Um, for the moment, we are uh, using uh, intercostal blocks surgically used. Um, we had some experience with plexus blocks and serratus arterial blocks as well. But for the moment, we do mostly a, a direct block through the intercostal space surgically before closure for the moment. But uh, through experience with the, uh, with the former set as well, we are trying to move to a plexus block as well, and uh, even discussing the serratus block as well. Epidural, we are probably not going to plan. Um, we are not, don't have as much, as much experience here in our center for the moment. And uh, uh, Alexander, what's your current uh, pain management? Uh, our, pain, uh, our pain management is uh, not some different from the uh, sternotomy and uh, and uh, because uh, because we all uh, do muscle uh, muscle sparing uh, sarcotomy i uh, believe that uh, some most of the pain is uh, coming from the chest uh, drain not from the incision not from the muscles because uh, uh, after the chest drain is uh, off uh, uh, children uh, can it can be mobilized uh, very quickly with uh, the free movement uh, in the right arm. So uh, we just should uh, focus more on a softer uh, chest drain. Um, that, that's, that's excellent. Um, and uh, Alexander, would you uh, please talk about your uh, very challenging case uh, of uh, repairing of Falcapa and a mitral valve uh, with a patient with severe left ventricular dysfunction, which will make a lot of us uh, uh, scared about thinking even about the approach uh, with minimally invasive in a patient like this. So please uh, go ahead. Um, uh, so uh, it was uh, a kid with a late uh, uh, presentation, uh, one year old with uh, Alcapa and uh, severe mitral insufficiency. And uh, because uh, uh, our team has uh, the experience uh, with uh, the getting the access to the pulmonary artery, with the getting the access to the mitral valve through the right axillary osteocotomy, uh, I uh, decided why not, uh, why not uh, to correct uh, and to repair this uh, defect because uh, from 
the cosmetical point of view, from the clinical point of view and uh, uh, psychological, it is uh, the best in the decision uh, for the kid if, if we need to do a surgery for the congenital heart uh, defect. Um, I, uh, so so I, I just want uh, to mention a few things uh, which I think to be uh, important. And the first one is uh, the myocardial uh, protection because uh, usually uh, the repair from the side, from the right axillary thoracotomy, it uh, takes uh, a little bit longer than the repair in the, the then the repair in the same uh, defect from the mid and median uh, sternotomy, at least at the beginning, because the anatomy is a little bit different. You have a little bit less uh, uh, assistant uh, help. So um, we should be sure that the myocardial uh, protection is just uh, some very good. Uh, for all the pediatric uh, cases, we use uh, the blood cardioplegia, with, which is uh, some just cold blood and uh, 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 potassium on a pump with some uh, uh, magnesium, some uh, lidocaine and uh, uh, so on. So it's actually a cold, cold blood cardioplegia that we are giving every 30 minutes, uh, uh, sometimes a little bit so longer. The, the some second uh, thing is I will share screen now and uh, I will uh, I will uh, to, to go for some uh, 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 details that I wish uh, to mention um, and uh, I wish uh, to say that uh, for, uh, for for some of these uh, for some of these, uh, uh, defects. We should we should uh, have a little bit uh, more room uh, inside the chest. So and if uh, we uh, can use uh, the a malleable small uh, uh, cannulas for uh, SVC and for IVC, we can some put them on the side and we can win some uh, s s space for the surgeons. Uh, the second uh, thing uh, that uh, even after after we uh, apply all the lines, we can uh, push them uh, uh, to the side. And uh, I have learned uh, this during my uh, stay. I stay in the uh, Maria Ferrari Hospital from uh, uh, Dr. Van, and uh, I am very happy uh, with this uh, technique. Uh, one more thing which is uh, important is that, uh, that uh, we never uh, tie the pericardial uh, stitches, uh, the pericardial uh, sutures uh, to the skin, because if, if you tie, you have the fixed some hot, so you can uh, operate only on a one so zone. But if the pericardial stay uh, uh, switches are some flexible, you can uh, rotate and you can get the access when you wish to the right ventricle outflow uh, tract to the pulmonary artery, or you can uh, push the uh, other side of the pericardium and you will get the access to the mitral valve and um, other things. So uh, the next uh, scene is uh, the surgical instruments. I uh, really uh, believe that uh, uh, industry should uh, uh, help us. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, we use uh, some bayonet uh, uh, Debecky forceps, which uh, also some helps uh, surgeon to uh, keep the hands out of the view. So you can manipulate like a, a neuros, uh, neurosurgeons uh, with the forces, but, uh, but uh, the view of the surgeons is um, 
not uh, uh, of uh, school and the same uh, with the hooks and the uh, same with the aortic uh, clamps not uh, straight but some bended and uh, uh, my last uh, slide is just uh, to show uh, how I put uh, how I put the exposure for the VSD uh, uh, sutures because I uh, uh, also use uh, the same uh, technique that uh, that uh, you, Doctor uh, Said, some mentioned. So uh, the loops under the cords, but also uh, additionally uh, we can uh, put a, a stitch uh, on the moderator. And when you pull it, so you change the perspective of the intraventricular uh, septum. So uh, then with a small uh, hook, you can uh, retract the leaflets and you can have a better access uh, to the VSD. Uh, also, you can save, save uh, the space by the using of the, uh, uh, some snares, by the using of snares uh, uh, instead of the, instead of the large some snares. So these are just a small, some tricks that helps to win some uh, space. And uh, also for VSD, we also put a snare uh, around the pulmonary artery just to uh, prevent the back some bleeding from the pulmonary artery because you have like less uh, uh, space uh, not you don't have extra space to put uh, the socket in the right ventricle so that, that um, also helps um and uh, I uh, some uh, most of my uh, technique I uh, some learn from uh, these two some great uh, some surgeons, and uh, I also wish to say some words uh, because I was very impressed maybe more than ten years uh, ago uh, by the videos of uh, Doctor uh, Ali Doch uh, uh, when I see your video while. Uh, doing this at some wide uh, spectrum of the VSD, I some realize that uh, we can do some much more than than the just uh, ASD repair. So also to some thank you very much. Thank you. This this is really a, a great point. And this is the 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 main message really from this webinar to everybody is the and I think uh, uh, Ali you really nicely summarized this in your last slide is the uh, uh, important that the auxiliary approach is safe, reproducible, and more importantly, teachable. Uh, I, I definitely agree. Uh, I think the, the there's a couple of myths that need to be dissipated. One is the pain about thoracotomies. It's just simply not true. If we open up gently, don't break the ribs, our muscle sparing, uh, I do not see how a thoracotomy can be more painful than a sternotomy. It's a myth and it needs to go away. Um, with regards to safety, um, you know, I still see teams who uh, put the uh, sternotomy uh, incision on the skin and drape the entire sternum in case they get into trouble. You know, I, I understand, but what ultimately what is the worst thing that can happen to you is that you have bleeding at your aortic cannulation site. And I think all of us have enough experience to cannulate an, an aorta. And if sometimes it's difficult, well, you abandon it and then you go femoral. Um, so I think safety has to be uh, guaranteed. And I think we have uh, enough experience to, to say that it's really safe. And with regards to the quality of repair, uh, you know, all of us have shown in this, uh, in, in our various videos that if you have little tips and tricks to give yourself exposure, because that's really what most congenital heart surgery is about, good optimal exposure, well, then you can, you can do the same type of repairs. And I think uh, more and more, all of us are uh, feeling 
comfortable doing these and being able to teach them reproducibly. So uh, hopefully uh, I think this is here to stay because uh, it's a benefit to the kids. There's no question. Uh, absolutely. And uh, we we sometimes in our field underestimate the psychological impact of uh, the procedure and the incision. We are happy that we performed uh, a good repair, closing a VSD for a child, but he will be scarred for the rest of his life uh, with a sternotomy. Um, and this is has to has to change. Uh, unfortunately, when when I personally when I meet with the families, sometimes um, you know they have uh, requested uh, several opinions, etc. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we hear the myth coming from cardiac surgeons uh, who uh, 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 sometimes say it's not safe, etc. Uh, but I'm glad that we all agree this is a, a really reproducible approach and good for the patients. And um, it's it's funny how uh, our initial experience, the difficulty was to convince the patient that they can go home on post-op day one after uh, an, a, 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 a full open heart surgery. But I think we all demonstrated this uh, success. Um, one of the um, other things or other myth that we hear is the time on the cardiopulmonary bypass and the cross clamp time. Um, and uh, I'd like to hear your your opinions uh, about what do you think? I mean, I personally don't think it's not different from a sternotomy at all. I've seen no different regarding the bypass time, the cross clamp time, of it for VSDs or uh, PAVSDs. Yeah, I agree. We we actually looked at our experience comparing uh, more or less contemporary. Uh, um, De uh, defect repairs through sternotomy and from the side, the, the differences are minimum. Sure, you have to go a little bit slower because everything has to be perfect at the same time. You don't want to be redoing stitches, etc. And you have less room. And as uh, Alexander mentioned, you, you're, you're basically doing the operation solo. Your, your assistant can't help you much. So all of those little things take time. But when it boils down to it, instead of going from a 30 minute cross clamp time to 40 minutes, what is that in the life of a child? If you instead of going from 45 minutes of bypass to 60 minutes of bypass, what is that in the life of a child? It's nothing. Uh, if you get your myocardial protection done properly, as Alexander very properly stated, if you've got that right, then 15 minutes more or less is is irrelevant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another myth is the we already have discussed is the skeletal development and the scoliosis. But I think you elegantly pointed out how to avoid that. And uh, I, I think there are some studies already much longer term uh, from uh, um, uh, Switzerland group, actually, about the breast development um, decades down the road. I think the data we have are from the initial phase of experiences from the mid-axillary, uh, especially horizontal approach. And if you tend to what's going too 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 far, too far to an interlateral approach in the beginning, then you of course will have problems with breast development. But with the current approach going either vertical or mid axillary for for example horizontal incision, this data in a broad range of patients, I think we don't have it really at the moment. But if we are waiting another couple of years and we look at the data, maybe we see a difference. But I think if you, if you follow certain rules, as Professor Dodge Katani mentioned already. You can avoid the scoliosis. You can avoid the problems of breast development as well. And Absolutely, this approach is, is very, very advantageous for for young patients as well. Absolutely. Uh, another myth: What do you think about uh, risk of uh, residual lesions? Have you noticed any um, anything regarding this approach, like a second pump time uh, or things different? I guess there's, there's a certain learning curve, especially for other, speaking for myself as a young surgeon, and there's a certain learning curve, and you have to, uh, so things can happen, as Professor Dodge Katami mentioned, and, but I haven't seen any uh, thick cross clamp times or very large rate of additional lesions, lesions um, um, after minimal abysis. Yes, in the beginning, it takes longer. You have to be more careful, and you always, uh, be more meticulous in your approach, but uh, I have not seen the difference yet. Also in the data, you have not seen the difference. I, and, I, agree. Uh, I agree. Excellent. Well, one interesting thing that I've noticed, which is a trend, is 
the reluctance we we had this experience in Houston where initially this was something completely new nobody had heard about and um, pediatric cardiologists were a little bit nervous to refer patients um, they did ultimately for big VSDs or big ASDs or PAPDRs which you know had clear indications for operations in symptomatic patients and and enlarged right ventricles we noticed over the just one year that once we gave them perfect results with no residuals, no extra complications, less ICU and less hospital times, and parents that were absolutely, you know, beside themselves with uh, with happiness, we noticed a trend of referring patients for small VSDs, uh, smaller ASDs in asymptomatic kids uh, from from the pediatric cardiologists who were then demanding that we please do this through the right axillary. And that, I, I found that interesting, uh, you know, rather than to sit on a kid for a decade, you know, because it's asymptomatic and maybe the VST will close on its own or whatnot, uh, we saw that trend go away if we provide quality and excellent results. And I, th I think that was interesting. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will echo that. And uh, we noticed actually, which was a point about to mention, even transcatheter interventions for ASDs, now we have a frank discussion and in full informed consent with the family, with the interventional cardiologist and the surgeon. And guess what? Family does not want the device. They want uh, a, a quick surgery in and out recovery, superior cosmetic, no issues with down the road. Uh, so that changed even the, not just the indication, as you mentioned, and the timing, the mentality about which approach we should take. I think when we talk about residual lesions, you also have to discuss the indication. If you look at uh, ACs, DCs, xenocinosis, for example, the risk for additional lesions or a, a reoperation in the time of life is not high. But if you look at um, left AV valve um, indications, for example, PAVSDs or a complete AV canal, and this is another issue. So even in patients with a partial AVSD, they can come back later in life in rare cases for a second surgery. And this is where you have to discuss whether if you do a minimal invasive approach, you also do the reoperation minimal invasive. This, we, we, we experienced that. We did reoperations from the side for, for example, a complete AV canal. It's possible, but it's very challenging. So this is something you have to think about also if you take a patient, for example, with a left AV valve or a cleft CAVSD or ZAVSD. Um, through a thoracotomy as well in, young, in a young age. This is something you have to think about and we don't have any data on that, I think, from the long term. If you look at uh, reoperation and later, later in life. This is a great point uh, as well, Paul. Um, one, one other point is, um, why do you think there is reluctancy in uh, this approach taking over the standard stenotomy for simple heart defects or you know, or more complicated, like uh, Alexander showed, uh, because that's that's a question I hear from families. If this approach is so good, why no, uh, not everybody's doing it? Um, can you please highlight your thoughts? Yeah, Ali, we start with Ali. Uh, I may say. Or Alexander, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I may say that uh, three years, uh, to do this, uh, uh, surgeon uh, should be out of, of the of the comfort zone. But uh, actually, this is not uh, the problem. If uh, if uh, the surgeon uh, was some trained or he was in the department where these approaches were uh, as a regular as a as a routine. So there is uh, no uh, 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 discomfort because uh, then if it's uh, some routine, uh, you see it, you know the tips, you know the complications, you you are familiar. So uh, and uh, it is uh, the same as uh, the uh, progress in the uh, adult uh, uh, cardiac surgery. So if you have been uh, trained in the, in the department where the minimal invasive adult cardiac surgery is a routine, you will always do like this. Yeah, if, if I could add, and I think this is really a, a philosophical 
point of view, which is personal. Um, Paul brought up a very important point. I, I remember when I read the papers from Bern saying that they were doing this for complete AD canals, I was quite impressed, um, partially technically, but also because of the thought process. I think if we do surgery in from the front standard with all of the room in the world established for AV canal, and let's say that redo AV valve, left-sided AV valve surgery is uniformly accepted at a 15% rate sometime down the line and or uh, subaortic uh, you know, obstruction. To, to me, if I know that um, that that is the case, I would probably be reluctant to offer a surgery from the side, whereby the global experience of reoperating from the side has not yet reached that level that we have in doing redo sternotomies third, fourth, fifth time. So uh, I think for, for this to become really universal to many other types of lesions, including those in which we know there will be a certain degree of reoperation, tetralogy, complete AV canal. Once once we get comfortable to do redo right thoracotomies and recannulate and free up the heart and et cetera, uh, then at least philosophically for me, it would be easier to you know, offer that as a first step. But until uh, you know, we've reached that level of comfort, which needs to come at some point, um, I kind of limit the indications to operations, which are really, it's one one operation, cured, done. We are not anticipating redo, operate, redo surgery in the future, but you know, I'm sure as we gain more experience, that comfort zone may shift for all of us. Great point, I, Ali. Uh, uh, and Paul, what, what do you think? What's your point on this? I, I, do, I do agree with Professor Dr. Katami on this issue. Um, regarding our CABSC series from Bern, uh, there were highly selected cases. So it was very, very easy, as a very uh, mild forms of CABSC, mostly erosity type A's. Also, some patients with small VSD portions, and um, there were still CABSCs, but um, it was very easy to correct. So, we anticipated a lower rate of left AV valve um, reoperation, which is not guaranteed, of course. And we've been just mentioned 15% reoperation rate. But um, is it possible to extend the spectrum to a CABSD? But you have to be very, very, very selective in the cases, especially also with the VSDs, doing super crystal VSDs and so on. And you have to be very selective because it's very easy to um, destroy your good data with a few bad cases, to be honest. So we have to be very careful about the selection process. Uh, Paul, Paul makes very good points. I, I, I tell the cardiologist, please, you need to prove to me that this is a very simple cleft, nothing more, nothing fancy. We're not going to start, you know, changing, you know, moving cordae around, uh, doing uh, patches in the valve, etc. Because that's that means a redo is imminent. So I think really the indications to do simple work on the mitral valve uh, are okay. But trying to do complex stuff is, I, I you know, it's yeah. I mean, we, we all do have our nightmare cases. And for example, we had a patient with a PAVSD not not long ago. We did from the side, and the AV valve preoperative looked fine, but intraoperatively, if we looked in the valve, it was severely dysplastic. And as soon as we changed the geometry of the cleft, we had a severe um, left valve regurgitation. It was very difficult to reconstruct. So this patient might be back in a couple of years. We don't know. We had a good result in a while, but that this doesn't guarantee long-term durability as well because we did a lot of um, coceroplasty, uh, cleft repair and so on. So this is not a guarantee that you have a good result of a complex uh, left AV valve that has a long-term long durability. So this might be a patient we will see again in a couple of years. I don't know. But yeah, there are the, those, those cases exist as well. You have good preoperative um, diagnostics and then in the operating room you have something different. But everything we all know this can happen. Excellent points, um, and um, I think uh, uh, for surgeons who will start this, obviously uh, there is a learning curve, but uh, um, getting the exposure first and be comfortable with doing a simple ASD closure and orienting yourself through the anatomy and, uh, and the chest wall can slowly start moving yourself to anomalous veins and and uh, uh, a simple restrictive VSD, and 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 over time, this will uh, will uh, be a game changer for your patients.
Um, there is a lot of questions uh, uh, that I hope we addressed uh, from the audience, uh, all related to breast development and scoliosis and uh, uh, safety. And I hope uh, we uh, highlighted the uh, main points. Um, we would never uh, finish this webinar, uh, I think, because of how much uh, we can talk about every symbol, every single defect and the tips and the pitfalls. Uh, but I really uh, uh, think we're over the time now, and I would like to um, really uh, thank uh, all uh, our experts and uh, speakers today uh, for their valuable input. Uh, and I hope this webinar have highlighted the uh, really how this approach can be game changer for the patients, for the cardiologists, for the community, and to change the image about uh, uh, open heart surgery in children. And uh, um, this webinar uh, will, will be uh, uh, on the CTS net, uh, hopefully next week. Um, but again, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Uh, uh, everybody appreciate your valuable input and valuable expertise. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I'll uh, turn the floor back now to John. My name is CTS Net Webinar. You can check out Dr. Saeed's full guest editor series on this congenital topic at ctsnet.org, along with hundreds of additional cardiothoracic surgery videos. As a reminder, a recording of today's webinar will be available Tuesday on ctsnet.org and ctsnet YouTube channel. To stay up to date with the latest youth ctsnet content and be an active part of the online global cardiothoracic community, be sure to create or update your ctsnet profile today. If you would like to submit your own video to ctsnet, head to the website to access the submission form. There's still time to submit to the 2023 Innovation Video Competition. Show off your innovative cardiothoracic surgery techniques and solutions by the extended deadline of September 15th for a chance to win a first place cash prize, community feature, and exclusive interview. Have a wonderful rest of your day.